Welcome everybody. I'm Professor Susan Watkins. I'm Director of the Centre for Culture and the Arts at Leeds Beckett University. I'd like to welcome you all to the eighth in our series of Leeds Cultural Conversations. The Centre has organised this series in partnership with Leeds City Council and it's also supported by the publisher Palgrave Macmillan. We're working closely with Palgrave on their campaign for the humanities. There is one more talk in this series which is taking place in June so please visit our website for details. Just to let you know that the talks are being filmed and there will be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So today I'm delighted to introduce the very popular Dr <laughs> Rachel Rich, who is Senior Lecturer in European History at Leeds Beckett University. Rachel is an expert in the cultural history of modern Europe, as well as in the history of food and eating habits. Her book, Bourgeois Consumption, Food, Space and Identity in London and Paris, 1850 to 1914, was published in 2011. Today, Rachel will be talking to us on the subject of Cooking Without a Clock, Women, Domesticity and Timekeeping in 19th Century <coughs> Europe. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you all so much for coming here today. Um, it's a real honor for me to be part of these cultural conversations. And if you've been a regular attender at these events, you'll know I have some tough acts to follow. Um, the conversation I want to have with you today is about the intertwining of the two areas of my current research. And one is about the history of women and food, as Susan mentioned um, in her introduction. And the other is the history of clocks and timekeeping that I've become interested in over the past couple of years. Um, and what I'm going to try and do today is to kind of introduce you to a bit of both of those things, but mostly to try and talk about how, for me, they intertwine and how thinking about timekeeping in relation to cooking and to what women did in kitchens in the 19th century actually helps us to understand what modern Europe was about with the women in the picture in a way that the history of modern timekeeping up till now has excluded women from the picture. And just as a note for the academically minded amongst you. I am going to bring in examples from French history and English history in this talk. And if I was having to do this in a more formal academic setting, I would be very rigorous about my methodology on that front. But I'm allowing myself to be a little bit more easygoing about the comparisons. But do feel free to press me in the Q&A session about how I'm working those comparisons if you want to know a bit more about that. I'm going to start by telling you two stories, and I hope I know how to work the technology here. Uh, two stories that I came across when I was researching for my PhD some years ago. Um, and one is a story that was in Molly Hughes's memoirs of growing up in Victorian London. And it's about the dining room clock that the family went by. A typical phrase for that period, uh, and a typical thing to have a clock in either a living room or a dining room. Um, for the family to regulate themselves by. Um, you might often read about clocks as being things which dominated people's lives and ruled their lives, but actually Molly Hughes's mother saw the clock as a tool for her to use. And what she did, as in the story on the board, is she set the clock 10 minutes fast and she said it was to be on the safe side. She also confided to Molly that once that once that it caused visitors to go a little earlier than they otherwise might, for she had observed that they never trusted their own watches when faced with this clock. And so she didn't rule herself by the clock, she used the clock to manipulate people. And the second story, and the reason why these two stories stuck in my mind is because of how similar they are, is from a French newspaper. And it's about a man who was eating at what he referred to as one of the renowned cafes of the boulevard. And he says that during his meal, he looked at the clock on the wall to ensure that he wasn't going to be late for a business meeting and noticed it was seven o'clock, which was later than he thought. And the waiter, who knew this man to be a Parisian, leaned in and whispered in his ear, don't let yourself be influenced by the clock, sir. Why is there something wrong with it? And the, the waiter explained, it tells the time to foreigners and provincials. You know that those travelers go to the theater after dinner. In reality, it's only 6.30. And the explanation was that after people who they thought of as tourists, basically, had finished ordering, they would set the clock forward an hour so that people would rush and leave the tables so that other paying guests could sit down. And again, the idea was that people didn't know which 
to trust, and they would trust the clock on the wall. And it's probably not a true story. A lot of these kind of funny anecdotes in newspapers are probably not true, but I like it because it reinforces this idea that clocks could be used in these kind of slightly sneaky ways, rather than clocks being looked up to as the slave master, as is sometimes the way that they're characterized. And I think that for me, these two stories make sense in relation to the history of the rise of the middle class. This class, which has been characterized as a class of clock watchers, people who had clocks in the dining room that the family went by, people who liked timetables and orderliness, and for whom the value that the idea that time is money was a very kind of emblematic phrase for them. Um, other texts which kind of suggest this, you know, for example, in a book on domestic management, um, someone named Henry Southgate urged his readers, who he described as that large and important middle class, the comfort and well-being of which cannot be too earnestly desired. He urged them, if you desire to enjoy life, avoid unpunctual people. They impede business and poison pleasure. And similarly, Arnold Bennett wrote a kind of a self-help book, a jokey sort of self-help book, called How to Live on 24 Hours a Day, where he was making fun of this contemporary obsession with timekeeping. And he wrote, it has been said that time is money. That proverb underestimates the case. Time is a great deal more than money. Um, because we, all ha we only have a finite amount of time. You can't earn time the way you can earn money. So for him, looking after your time was even more difficult. Um, and I, I bring these up to kind of contextualize my two stories about misset clocks and show that they're part of a sort of a general cultural aspiration towards punctuality and good timekeeping, which shows itself in all sorts of places, including in the kitchen, um, but which I think is a little bit complicated because I don't think that it necessarily should be interpreted as saying that people were really clock watchers. They may have liked their clocks and wanted to be punctual, but in fact, their real relationship with timekeeping was a little bit more complex. Now, one of the ways that I started to discover, sorry, the history of timekeeping. So what happens here? <coughs> this is not, uh, ah, right. Uh, one of the ways I started to learn about this was through E.P. Thompson's theory, uh, the great British social historian E.P. Thompson, who wrote an article in the 60s called Time, Work, Discipline, and Industrial Capitalism. And he really saw the shift from early modern to modern as being characterized by the rise to prominence of clocks as a way of dominating people's lives. And this was because what he was interested in was the rise of capitalism. And he saw clocks as a tool of oppression, which bosses used to manage their employees. And it seems quite plausible, but it forgets a few things, this theory. And one is that it forgets that actually employees are just as interested in knowing when their shift ends as bosses are in knowing where the shift starts. So it's not all about the control of one class towards another. But I think what it also forgets is that the history of timekeeping exists outside of the factory. And it exists, in fact, in people's homes, like in Molly Hughes's mother's dining room, where she was trying to rush people away so that she wouldn't have to feed them dinner at dinner time because she couldn't afford that. Um, and that's the real thing about the clocks there. So what I've been trying to do is think about how you could do a history of timekeeping, which would move away from just thinking about public time and factory clocks and get inside people's homes and think about what went on there. And one of the historians whose work helped me to move on from E.P. Thompson's very strict theory that time, timekeeping came to dominate people's lives was the work of a historian called Hannah Gay, who looked at the actual technology of the clocks people had in their homes and their watches. And those are different from scientific clocks. So if you've ever been interested in the history of 
science and clocks as they were used in science, those were getting pretty accurate by the 19th century. But the technology that people had access to, most people in daily lives, actually wasn't that accurate. And it wasn't that easy to keep clocks synchronized. And that's kind of why people had a dining room clock that they went by and why they might not trust their watch, because time was different everywhere you went. And so what Hannah Gay argued, and what I think that I want to argue too, is that what people liked was the idea of punctuality, the idea of being on time and of managing your time as if time was money. But that's not actually representative of how they were living their lives. And, oh, sorry, there's a way of clicking it so you don't have to go through this rigmarole. Ah. And one of the documents that really kind of opened my eyes to how complicated timekeeping was and how impossible it is to imagine that everyone's lives were completely dominated by the ticking of the clock is a document by someone called John Milne. I think he was actually a geographer. Um, but he wrote this quite large document called Civil Time or Tables Showing the Differences in Time between that used in various parts of the world and Greenwich Mean Time. And what he had done was he had sent out a circular, basically a survey, all over the world. I mean, it's quite impressive, the scope of this document in the end. And he, when he got the answers back, he published them uh, in this document. And it showed the huge variety, ah, I nailed it, uh, the huge variety of ways that people were marking time in relation to Greenwich Mean Time, which had been accepted in 1884 as a kind of international standard, but where now we do it in sort of solid hours in relation to each other. These are funny bits of hours and minutes and seconds, and within countries, see these are all for Egypt, these entries. Within single countries, there might be lots of complex variations in how people told the time. Uh, the entry for India covers more than two pages because there are so many complexities of local and regional time variations. Uh, and if you think that that's because you know, India was far away and they didn't have the access to the same technology, that's not the answer because this is the entry for France. Um, I won't read the whole thing out, but I've highlighted, oh, it doesn't come up here. Anyway, I tried to highlight in red the bit I want to read out, which says, Paris, meantime, is used by telegraphs and railways, but real railway time is about five minutes slower than this, or 55 minutes slow on Central European time. Also, generally, the clocks inside stations are five minutes slow on those outside, these later showing Paris, meantime. Okay? So they may be like the idea of being on time, but I don't know how you negotiate that. Now, you want to get to the home of Greenwich Mean Time. Here we are, Great Britain. Greenwich Mean Time is the standard time. Great, that sounds really sensible. And is with rare exception used for all purposes. Among these exceptions, we find residents in Canterbury using a time about four minutes fast on Greenwich. Why do you bother? Um, and clocks at certain railway stations are sometimes one or two minutes fast. Apparent Greenwich and sometimes local sun time are used in connection with regulations relating to lamp lighting. Now it's possible that at some time if you've studied British social history, uh, you will have come across the argument that it was the invention of the railways that caused national times to become synchronized, coordinated, standardized. And that seemed to hold water. Uh, but I hope that now that I've shown you this, you'll start to believe me that it's not true. Uh, the railway companies tried to standardize time between the railway stations that a company served, but they couldn't regulate the time on the street outside the railway station, and they certainly couldn't do much more and then hope that the trains would vaguely run on time, and even that in a context where people couldn't necessarily trust their own watches. So if the middle classes were clock watchers, it's only because they liked the idea of punctuality as one of a set of ideas which helped them feel that they were maybe in control of the world around them, but not because they were always actually on time, because what could that possibly mean in a world where it's four minutes later in Greenwich than elsewhere, or in Canterbury than elsewhere in the country? So how do you go from what people have written to what they were actually doing? Well, one way that I've done this, and here's where my sort of comparative history becomes a bit difficult to maintain because what I did was I went to Paris um, and I 
counted clocks, uh, but I counted them in a source that doesn't exist, as there isn't a British equivalent. So there are some figures about clock ownership. Um, a couple of historians named Robin Winks and Joan, Joan Neuberger, who published a book on the history of modern Europe, estimate uh, in terms of clock ownership across Europe that it increased from about 350,000 at the start of the 19th century to 2.5 million in 1875. And that is, yes, a significant increase. Um, and they take this to mean um, that people began to sleep and rise according to the clocks and they refer back to E.P. Thompson and to the idea that clocks were how people managed their lives. But I don't think that raw numbers about clock ownership necessarily mean anything about what people were doing with those clocks. Um, a lot of people have clocks that aren't very good. And a lot of people, I don't know if anyone in this room does this, do that trick of setting the clock a bit fast. Yeah, a lot of people are nodding. I know people who do that and it freaks me out because I am a bit obsessed with punctuality. And if I'm at someone's house where they're doing that, I can't cope at all. Um, <laughs> but there you go. So what I did was I went to Paris and I looked at um, post-mortem inventories, these probate inventories that exist for France in this period, uh, but there isn't an equivalent that I can find for this country. But what they do is they tell you certain things about clocks. And one is that clocks were expensive compared to other things people had in their homes. Um, but they weren't just expensive because of the technology. They were expensive because they were beautiful. They were ornate. They were part of sculpted gold marble contraptions. They were objects which people valued um, for what they showed about good taste and about some sort of belonging of respectability. Um, but the other thing that the inventories can show you, uh, which raw data like this doesn't, is where the clocks were. Okay, so this, these are figures, just raw figures about clock ownerships. Um, I only looked at 31 inventories. They're really, really hard to get your hands on. And once you have your hands on them, they're hard to read. But I am going back in the summer to look for more. But for now, out of 31 inventories, this is the raw data about clock ownership. Um, there are four people who didn't own clocks, but those are all prior to 1865. After 1865, I don't find any homes with, without a single clock. And that's even among quite uh, working class homes. So it's not just rich people. I'm not just looking at the middle classes when I look for ownership. But the really interesting thing is where are the clocks? And the clocks are all some in bedrooms, some less ornate ones in bedrooms. So yes, maybe people are interested in what time it is when they go to sleep or wake up. But most of the clocks are in living rooms. And if they're not in living rooms, then they're in dining rooms. So the clocks are part of the public facade of the home. They're often in the spaces that people come to. Uh, and they're part of a show of respectability, of saying, you know, I am part of this culture that values good timekeeping. But the place where clocks never are, as far as I can tell in the French sources, is in kitchens. And that seems interesting to me, because the one place in the house where you kind of need to be able to keep track of time, if, like me, you enjoy cooking, is probably in the kitchen. So I find that fact more significant than the raw data about how many clocks there are, or how many more clocks there were in Europe at the end of the century than at the start, because it seems to me that it says that clocks were not tools for regulating work within the home. Um, for, for this country, I have less evidence. I have these very prescriptive sources. So I don't know anything about what people had. I have two images. This is from Alexis Soyer's cookbook. And this is from uh, Beaton's book of household management, which is the one book that I think everyone knows if you've ever heard of cooking in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and they both have images of clocks with kitchens in them. I was supposed to use a laser pointer here. My husband gave me this so I could show off my technology. Clock, <laughs> clock. Um, and one list, only one cookbook, where in the list of things you must have in your kitchen, it says a clock in first place. But she's the only one. This is from Chambers's, what's it called? Chambers' Cookery for Young Housewives from 1890. It's the only one, though. So I don't know if it's typical of anything. But what is true is that the history of, someone's having fun. <laughs> 
Um, the history of cooking and the history of timekeeping are intertwined. Um, when I said you need a clock in your kitchen, a lot of people in the room nodded, so I think that we all agree on this. And certainly cookbook writers and writers on domesticity weren't ignorant of that fact, and they wrote about it. Alfred H. Miles, in his book um, on domestic management, had a whole chapter on the measurement of time, in which he said that time is measured naturally by days, months, and years, and artificially by seconds, minutes, hours, weeks, quarters, decades, and centuries. And he's quite keen on the difference between natural time and artificial time. And the reason why he says seconds, minutes, and hours are artificial is because they're linked to the invention of clocks. And somehow that makes them, for him, a less authentic way of measuring time. Now this is quite a sort of a strange thing to find in a cookbook. Um, but in other ways, all cookbooks are implicitly, if not explicitly, books about regulating your time. And that's especially true, for example, of a book like Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, which is so much more than just a cookbook. It's a book which provides the reader with an entire plan for how to live every minute of the day, when to change your outfit, what kinds of conversations to have at which time of the day, when to read books and when to play the piano. It's very, very complex. Um, and that book was originally published in 1861, but from 1895 onward, editions of Mrs. Beaton do become even more explicit about timekeeping uh, by adding a statement which says that order and punctuality are so important to the comfort and happiness of the household that every mistress should fix stated hours for meals, etc., which ought to be strictly observed by every member of the family. And the advice is accompanied by what she refers to as a specimen card. This is her specimen card. And she advises every reader to make something like this to put up in their own kitchen. And the thing that she's regulating here is the meals of the day. So food and timing, again, are intimately linked because the way that people organize their days is with the meals as sort of punctuation marks. You know when morning is over and afternoon has begun because you've eaten your lunch. And that's how you know. Um, maybe in the north of England you've eaten your dinner, uh, but either way, you know what's happened. You've eaten and now you've moved on. Um, so there is this insistence on orderliness, on organization, on timekeeping and on routine. But at the same time, many, many cookbook writers have statements like this in their books, which say things like um, this example, which says that, um, a certain degree of caution is requ requisite in providing even a family dinner, as a casual visitor may unexpectedly enter, whose company cannot be avoided, and every man feels his consequence hurt, should such a visitor chance to drop into a dinner not sufficiently good or abundant. So if you're not as smart as Molly Hughes's mother to set your clock 10 minutes fast and hurry people out of the house, you may be forced to include them in your meal and make sure it's a good one. So all your efforts at timekeeping and management can't exclude the fact that your house can be entered by other people and they can expect you to change change your routine. So one of the ways that food and timekeeping go together is in terms of how we manage our bodies through the routines of mealtimes. But the other place that time figures in cookbooks and where it's even more explicit is obviously in the recipes themselves. If you use cookbooks now, you're probably very familiar with recipes which are very, very strict about how many minutes each part of the recipe will take. You boil your pasta for 12 minutes, you simmer your sauce for 25 minutes, whatever you're cooking, it has time included at every stage. And you might think it's hard to do it in any other way, um, but in the 19th century, I think there was a certain amount of ambivalence, which may be linked to the fact that there weren't necessarily clocks present in kitchens. And so people write recipes which either do or don't include information about timekeeping. So in 1822, there's a recipe for cœur de bœuf à la poivrade, which involves marinating beef for several days. How many is that? Um, and then grilling it and serving it. So you grill it, and magically you know when it's ready and you serve it. You don't need a clock. You need some sort of innate 
sense-based understanding of meat. And that's what women were expected to have. But in the same book, a different recipe for épaule de veau à la bourgeoise is a lot more precise. You need to put the veal in the oven for three hours. Fraise de veau needs to cook in the oven for two hours. So sometimes the assumption is you're using your senses, and sometimes the assumption is that maybe you have a clock. 1836, Chevrier has oyster soup. Cook on a very low heat for 20 minutes. That seems fairly precise. But on the next page, there are two other recipes for different kinds of soups where they don't say anything at all about time, and you're just supposed to magically know when it's ready. Obviously, if you cook a lot, you know it's not magic. You know when things are ready because you poke at them or you smell them or whatever. But the point is that there's an ambivalence about how important precise timekeeping is. This carries on until the very end of the century. Urbain Dubois is one of the most successful French cookery writers. And he has recipes which are precise and say things like cook the fish for eight to 10 minutes on a high heat. But on the other hand, he has others which say nothing. Um, and I think that that is showing that clocks have made inroads into people's homes, but maybe are not so present that we assume that everyone is always looking at one. Now, English visitors, no, I'm the visitor. Um, <laughs> you may be thinking, yeah, but that's the French. We do things differently over here. I've seen my Mrs. Beaton, and I know how she rolls. And indeed, Mrs. Beaton, she's very organized. She has a list of ingredients, well measured out, how many you need of everything. It's not just a prose discussion of how you might cook. It has the time. Every recipe in Beaton's book has time, average cost, and when it's in season. So that's pretty precise, and you know where you stand. And most people only know Mrs. Beaton, but she's not alone. And one of her contemporaries, equally successful at the time, though didn't maybe stand up to history so well, uh, was a woman named Georgiana Hill, who wrote things like, blanch small heads of celery, which you have shortened sufficiently, drain them, and simmer them in enough rich brown gravy, add a piece of butter and the juice of a lemon. No amounts, no timekeeping, nothing. Um, this is her recipe for sausage with apples. Um, a little bit better on timekeeping here. Doesn't tell you how long you have to boil for, but you can bake it in an oven for half an hour. Um, other English recipe writers are precise in their own ways. So Lady Constance Howard is really interested in how much you can cook a meal for. And when she teaches you a good way of cooking a pork chop, and by the way, I think this would really be a good way of cooking a pork chop if you wanted to do that. Uh, most of the recipes I read don't tempt me. Um, <laughs> but the only thing she's really precise about is how much it's going to cost you to cook this recipe. Uh, apart from that, it's just fry it well and make sure it's not dry. So you need to be on it in terms of timekeeping because that moment when the pork isn't pink anymore but hasn't become dry, that's a pretty quick moment. But there's no clock, there's no time, there's no amount, there's no even indication. Um, and as a way of kind of finishing off and turning over to you guys, um, but also of just underlining the difficulty of telling time in kitchens when you're cooking in the 19th century. Um, I want to end with this image. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a, a top of the line 1879 range for cooking with coal. And these are flames, lots and lots and lots of flames, uh, flaming flames and coal. Um, I don't know how easy you think it would be to regulate the temperature if you were cooking in an oven like that. So even if you did have a clock, and even if by some miracle your clock measured 10 minutes the same way as Mrs. Beaton's clock measured 10 minutes, how can your 10 minutes of cooking time possibly be the same as any other person's 10 minutes of cooking time when this is the technology that you're, that, that you're using? So by way of conclusion, I guess, I would want to say that I think the timekeeping was a really important and valued concept 
in the 19th century and that people liked owning clocks as a way of adorning their homes, but that the reality of it is that because of the technology that they lived with, it wasn't possible to regulate domestic life with clocks. And I stop. Rachel, that was great. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Is, is it not the case really that Thompson was right in that the development of the Industrial Revolution, I mean, time became powerful to the worker. I mean, he had to be back at work on time after dinner, which meant that the cooking had to be geared by time. I mean, I know even uh, you know, recently when I, when I was working, if, if they didn't, we didn't turn off on time, we were sacked, or we were caught, and that is got time taken off. And so the whole culture really yeah. depended upon, as Thompson says, capitalism. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as cooking's concerned, I mean, it is a flexible thing, so I don't have a clock in the kitchen. Uh, mind you, my cooking's probably not very good. Uh, you know, but they had to have the meals on time, so they had to know how long the meals were going to take to prepare, because the bloke had to drive or she had to yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, I mean, in as much as what Thompson is saying is there was a time when work started and a time when it ended, and you had X amount of time for lunch, I think that that's absolutely fine. I think that what happened was because Thompson is so influential, most books that you read subsequent to that, if they're talking about time in the 19th century, they'll literally just say, well, and of course, as E.P. Thompson says, everyone lived and died by the, you know, everyone went by the clock, everyone the clock, the clock, the clock. And the problem is that what that does is it makes it seem like something is absolute, which was really only regulating one area of people's lives. Now, meals had to be on time, but not just because people had to get back to work, but because people eat together. The whole social fabric is held together by the fact that people join together for meals. So there has to be a kind of a degree of agreement about time but maybe not to the same extent as some of the sources make it out. Yes? When did the countdown timers start the period? Well, Alexis Soye does have a kind of a kitchen timer that he's recommending in the 1890s, I'm going to say. I don't know when it was, you know, that's the, the, one, the one you mentioned I've seen of it. Um, it isn't referred to necessarily in recipes. Like, I've only seen one mention of it. He's kind of recommending it. A lot of the cookbooks, they advertise products as a way of, I guess, financing the publication. So it's kind of an advert. Um, I don't know how good they were, and I don't know when they become widely used. But they were around by the end of the century, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's just an off-the-cuff question, but cooking is also, if you can afford it and have the time, is about creativity. And you can be creative with spices, with herbs. I'm just very aware that my nana, who was Geordie White, very much by the clock, but my grandma, who was Jamaican, never looked at a clock in her life. It was your eyes, your yeah. taste. Yeah. So I'm thinking about domesticity and women as opposed to going out into the factories as much as, say, the iron foundries and whatever. But you've got a different, perhaps, female-centered version of time yeah. and timekeeping. And perhaps if you're looking at the Industrial Revolution, you can lose sense of that because we're going by what we think is the majority, but actually it's not. Domesticity was by far the majority because the women were at home. Yeah, and I think that that's, you know, that's a great, a great um, contribution because I think that that's one of the things I'm really interested mm -hmm. in is how do you have a history which includes the idea of modernity and of how the industrial revolution was affecting people in all sorts of ways, but that takes in what was going on at home where a lot of women were doing a lot of what is real work. And yes. also a lot of the cookbooks add a layer of complexity to that because they're written for two audiences, even though it's not always overtly said, because they're written to the, the mistress of the house and to the housekeeper or cook and they kind of go between the two so they're written to the person who's going to be watching her husband enjoy the food and the person whose job it is to produce that food. Um, so creativity doesn't 
always come into it. Whereas if you're looking at manuscript cookbooks, of course that's different because then you get what people were actually doing. Because the other thing about cookbooks is they tell you all sorts of interesting things about the ideals of domesticity, but they don't tell you a single thing about what people actually cooked. Because you don't know in a cookbook, Mrs. Beaton has something like 900 pages of recipes. No one cooked, you know, no single person cooked all of those. Maybe they cooked one or two. So, you know, the people doing the cooking may have been all sorts of creative, but you, you, it's hard to access that. Yeah. They used to write their own cookbooks. My great grandmother was a farmer's wife, and we were sorting through a load of stuff. We found her own handwritten, just an exercise book with recipes written out that she'd, you know, that. Yeah, the yeah. Hard, hard and fast recipes that they use. And, yeah. You know, slips of paper put in and everything. And yes. those are really different, right? Because that's a real intimate that was access she, to yes, that and person. That she got recipes from other people, and it was, you know, the basis of their life was built around that, and, the, and it related to their cooking facilities. Yeah. Like my grandmother had one of the little ovens, you know, they had a kitchen range, and she could slow cook things like rice pudding, you know, but leave it for a few hours. Things that could be left for hours where you didn't need to be bothered with time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and things like that. You could just put it in there and leave it for... And of course, if you're writing your own recipe, you know how you are. You, you know, and she knew, she knew, I mean, yeah. you know, she, she knew the time. You know, they, they get used to their own ovens and their own time. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. we probably all do that at home anyway. Yeah. When I moved house, my new oven didn't work the same no, as the you, old you, one you had, and you get used, used to it. it. Yeah. And someone just behind you. Well, yeah. well, you actually said probably what I was thinking, that... Um, Mrs. Beaton was all very well, but unless the mistress of the house can pass that on to yeah. the rest, I mean, how how much would the uh, the cook or whoever have to be able to read? I'm really curious about that. I think I, I, I'm sort of working towards actually writing paper on this because I've been reading a lot of cookbooks the last few weeks and sort of thinking about that relationship. And some of them are written, there are cookbooks that are late in the century written specifically for the cook or the servant, the, you know, so not to the mistress. Mrs. Beaton is trying to do both. But I don't know, you know, like, who, and, and who, you know, like, when your job is cooking, I can't imagine that you keep going back to recipes. No. Because once you've cooked something no. once, you don't look again. You no. know, the next time you do it your way, so, I think there's still a big, big question mark over who the cookbooks were for and what they were for. And definitely very middle class because uh, I mean, E.T. P. Thompson might say maybe towards the end of the 19th century that the clock was ruling, but when you'd got, for instance, the 10 hour act coming in, and, and so you'd got children working, you'd got women <coughs> working, yeah. you'd got the family, uh, timekeeping wasn't possible. I seem to remember at one stage there were a thousand fish and chip shops in mm. Bradford because people had the kind of time to cook. Yeah, yeah, and of course the, 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 um, the sort of the meal that I would call lunch, I guess, is something that was mostly a meal for middle class women because they were the only people who were at home in the day because if you were working or if you were a man, you know, man of any class, you probably weren't there and so those meals become things people have on the fly or cafes or whatever. Um, that's why you got Cornish pasties. And yes, exactly. Like yeah, all, all, and 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 all sorts of things that that, that start spring up. You know, Lions Corner Houses and all these places are also doing a you know a roaring lunchtime trade. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 We have a range very much like that in our house, and uh, we actually tried using it really <coughs> by pushing the coals to the back of the oh, yeah. range. Mm -hmm. And I think what surprises how much of a slow cooker it is. Something which, you know, a stew which will cook really quickly in, in a normal oven. I think it took me well, about 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it shows you how much you have to adjust to a much, yeah, you know, yeah. planning ahead. You know, yeah. like the lady in the front there said, yeah, like yeah, you did. I think they you know, it was yeah. slow it took a cooking. long time. Yeah, I came across a recipe for yeah. carrot soup which said, well, the carrots for three to four hours. <laughs> Um, which is also a big margin of error, so I think that again shows that you couldn't regulate, you know, like, three. that's a big difference, three hours or four hours. So if you were planning a meal, and as the gentleman at the front said, you know, people needed to know when they were going to eat, but at the same time, you know, you have to know, is it going to be three hours or four hours? So you have to have done it a couple of times, I guess, before you know. Because my grandmother used to bake bread, and she used to prove the bread, because they, 
the timing of the, it was just the right sort of temperature for proving the rain, right, rain right. yeah, because it was such a slow cooker. Mm -hmm. And also, you see, it depends on the drawer on your chimney. Mm -hmm. If it's a very still day, your you fire's not going to burn quite as well. Mm -hmm. as yeah. Burn. Yeah, I mean, the flames here, I think, are definitely just, yeah. just <laughs> for show. <laughs> just for show. Yeah. Yeah. That just shows you how difficult it is. You could say, put it in the oven for three hours, but if it's drawing really slowly, yeah. you, you know, it might be another. And second. actually, some. Some cookbooks tell you cooking times for winter or summer. Mm -hmm. uh, because, and I don't know if that's, you know, I, I wasn't sure why, but now that you've said that, maybe yeah. that's why, because it might take a different amount yeah. of time depending on the conditions. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. It was just a thought that um, a lot of households might not have had a clock, but have external controls. Uh, the the whistle from the factory or the, the church, the knocker, you know, yeah. um, the bells in the church yeah. and yeah. things like that. That, that, right. that was a, a cue. Yeah. You knew when the, you know, the shipyards were out. And people had been using <laughs> church bells yeah. to, to, to measure their time for centuries yeah. already. That wasn't a kind of modern thing. So yeah, absolutely. Well, and just you know that distinction between natural time and artificial time. You know. The, the daylight. I mean, there's all you know. There's all sorts of ways that we know the time. And I don't cook with a clock either. I think once once you get into the swing of cooking, you just know when the, you know. You just know. Um, but it is handy sometimes to be able to check. In, in the better households, would perhaps the you, you gave us a sort of timetable of when meals were scheduled. So on the one hand, it seemed that like not having a clock in the kitchen would mean that for servants they might have more freedom about what they do and how they do it. But but surely the meal times would mean that they do have a schedule to work against. In theory, that seems right, but I'm suspicious because the number of books that come out every year berating people for not getting meals on the table on time suggests to me that there's a big disjunction between what cookbook writers are wishing that servants and their mistresses could manage and what people are actually managing. And you know that servants are very, very hard to manage. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't need that big book. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but if they're being berated, then there's an expectation. Yeah. Which is not being met. No. And I, well, I, the, the other thing there is, is there's, there's a way that women are spoken to by cookbook writers, which is about making sure that your man is well fed and happy and on time. And that the restaurant, once it becomes a kind of dominant cultural form after the middle of the century, becomes the big threat. You know, like, you better get the meals ready nice and on time, because otherwise he's going to go out to the restaurant and your marriage is going to end in your room, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so there are other incentives for time people. Anyone else? Okay, well, Rachel, thank you very much indeed. Let's give her a